So it was just over a month ago that we took our first look at the Zotac Gaming GeForce GTX 1660 non-TI. So this is the non-TI version, it's missing a couple of SMs, and it's running 6 gigabytes of GDDR5 rather than GDDR6 like the GTX 1660 TI is. But after finishing the initial review, I started talking around to some other people who had one of the cards, not necessarily this one, but different variants of the 1660, and we were discussing overclocking, because in that review video, I did a little bit of overclocking, very light, like only a little over 100 megahertz to the core, and 250, uh, plus 250 on MSI Afterburner, which resulted in 8.5 gigabits per second, rather than the stock 8. So what we found was, these things overclock like mad, at least on the memory. The GPU core got an additional 209 megahertz, which set it around 2050 megahertz under load. So still good, but very typical of even Pascal and Turing for being able to hit those clock rates. But the memory went from eight gigabits per second to 10. But what does that mean in terms of gaming performance? And well, synthetics, because well, you can't do it without taking at least a quick look at synthetics to see about thermals and power power draw. Yeah, thermals and power draw to see the difference and the benefit or not so benefit because sometimes, no matter how much you overclock it, they don't really get that much faster. But what about this one? Well, let's take a look at it right after we go through our test bench, which is a Z370 based system with a Core i9-9900K at 5 gigahertz across all cores and zero AVX offset along with 16 gigabytes of DDR4-3200. Now with that out of the way, let's take a look at the first set of results featuring synthetics and power and thermals. Firestrike is up first with a healthy gain of 12%. It definitely shows that there is, um, well, there's definitely some gain there, and man, that RX 580 is really standing, standing tall in Fire Strike these days. But moving on to Time Spy, we see a 15% increase, so even more of an increase than what we saw before, and that's pretty healthy. Now, let's take a quick look at thermals, and thermals, we only see a 5% increase in thermals, and power draw an 8% increase. Now, the importance there of those increases in power and thermals is well, how much performance gain are you getting and how much power and heat are you gonna increase to get there? So far, so good. Now let's get into the games themselves. We're gonna kick things off with Hitman 2 running at 1080p Ultra and all of these tests going forward will be at 1080p because that's what this card is targeted at. And we see here an 8% increase in performance which is definitely nothing to turn your nose up at. Unfortunately, Hitman 2 still suffers from abysmal 0.1% lows, just like the original, or the original remake of Reboot, I don't know, the original Hitman 2016, when it came out a few years ago. Moving on to Forza Horizon 4, we see the GTX 1660 manual overclock carrying a massive 14% performance improvement, which is insane in a good way. That definitely takes it from 93 up to 106 and boost up those minimum FPSs. Now, moving into Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and once again, this is kind of an anomaly, so later, whenever we talk about the overall performance increase, we're going to exclude this one because a 42% performance increase on the average FPS is ludicrous. It was this, well, we didn't get that same, but we still got a huge bump in the prior test, but you're going from 60 to 85 FPS average. That's insanity. Uh, moving into Rainbow Six Siege, already a game that runs at ridiculously high frame rates and is a game that is very well at home on a 240Hz panel, especially with this card, because we went from 187 to 211. I'm not so certain you're going to be able to see that, but that does result in a 13% increase. Far Cry New Dawn was tested at ultra settings, 1080p again, and we see here a very healthy 12% increase, so from 84 to 94, and it brings the 0.1% up over that 60 FPS mark, making it, if you wanted a lock 60 FPS experience, you'd get it there. Now, Assassin's Creed Odyssey is not exactly the most friendly on graphics cards. It's a game that I've been playing a lot lately, and it's destroying my 980 Ti and making me want to upgrade finally. But we see here another healthy improvement at 13% going from 70 up to 79 average FPS, and even on the 0.1% lows, we do see a benefit there as well. The Division 2 is fairly new and fairly intensive, 
but running it at DX12 Ultra, we see an enormous 19% gain on the manual overclock from the default settings. So from 64 up to 76, and that minimum 0.1% goes from 44 to 52, really smoothing out the gameplay. Battlefield 5 on DX11 with Ultra settings, we see a 15% performance boost from 75, where it trailed just behind the RX 580 to, well, quite a bit out ahead of it. It's very interesting to see that, and definitely kudos on the aging Polaris architecture holding its own. Metro Exodus and 1080p DX12 with ultra settings, however, PhysX is disabled. We see here a 17% increase. Now, there is no DXR being run on there, so no ray tracing. Definitely not. Those, those numbers were terrible. And last but not least, we have Resident Evil 2, where the GTX 1660 with the manual overclock sees a very healthy 18% gain on the average FPS, and the 0.1% lows come up quite a bit. So at the end of the day, it's definitely worth overclocking this booger. Now, to get these numbers, we had to go, again, 209 megahertz on the core. Probably could have got a little bit more out of it, but we kind of stopped there just because the real gains were on the memory side. Probably should have seen what would happen if I only overclocked the memory. But again, you take the six gigabytes of GDDR5 all the way up to 10 gigabits per second by going plus 999 on MSI Afterburner, which is absolutely insane. And wow, I mean, these performance gains are the kind of performance gains that I remember getting back in the day, like with say the the Radeon HD 7950, I used to have one of those, overclocked like mad, made me wonder why the 7970 existed, of course, you know, you could overclock it and it would get better. Same thing goes here. I don't have a 1660 Ti on hand, but I can promise you that with the performance increase here and knowing where it stands near the 1660 Ti, if you really don't wanna spend that extra money, 220 bucks, it's a lot of power in this little card and it fits in pretty much anything. So at this point, I'd love to hear your thoughts on overclocking these mid-range cards. Do you do it? If you do, what kind of experience are you getting? And this has been Keith with WCCF Tech TV. Make sure that you're subscribed and hit that notification bell so that we don't miss you in the next one.